Glasser from Foreign Policy Magazine, and I wanted to, can you, not here? Can you hear now? Can you hear now? Well, that was better. Okay, that's too loud. Let's try again. I'm Susan Glasser from Foreign Policy Magazine. And as you can see, that's Steve Clemens behind us uh, from the New America Foundation. Jim Traub from Foreign Policy, contributing editor to the New York Times Magazine. Pauline Baker, terrific partner of ours, head of the Fund for Peace, and really the driving force behind the, the failed states index, which is sort of the reason we brought you all here today. So. Uh, I'll give a little bit more of an introduction, but first of all, I wanted to thank you for coming. This is uh, really part of the launch for our new issue of the magazine, which uh, in some ways has been our most viewed ever online, and I think it's because it's a really unique effort every year to take stock of the rest of the world in a most unusual way, and, and, and the goal of the Failed States Index, which is now in its sixth annual year of collaboration between the Fund for Peace and foreign policy is is to is to step back and take stock not just of the conflict zones that you read about every day but the countries that you don't read about every day and to look at these places with real metrics and to put some real scrutiny on why it is that not only these states are failing but that in some way we're failing in our effort to think about how to respond to these challenges. And so that's the subject of our conversation today. Both Jim and Pauline and Steve bring a lot to the table there, not only their collective wisdom about these countries themselves and, and years of deep study and thinking about what's happening in these countries, but also, and I think particularly relevant for our conversation here today, what is the United States doing about countries like this? What should the United States be doing? It was just a couple months ago that the U.S. Defense Secretary, Robert Gates, wrote an article and called the problem and the challenge of failed states the defining security challenge for the United States in this day and age. And, and I think that that, first of all, is, is an astonishing and pretty sweeping claim, which I'm hoping our panelists can unpack for us today. But it also, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a remarkable statement about uh, places and countries where the U.S. really has a very, very hard time showing a record of success over a period of time. And, and I'm reminded of that, actually, in working on this issue of the magazine. And, and I think it's out there and available for, for you today. And if you haven't seen the print issue, I do suggest that you pick it up. When we were researching this, we went back and we looked, and we realized that failed states first entered uh, the U.S. policy lexicon uh, in the 1990s. Uh, actually in an article in Foreign Policy magazine, but that was specifically talking about the dilemma of, uh, you know, international obligations when countries fail. What, what's the international legal ramifications of this? And um, what was going on at the time? Well, of course, it was Somalia. Uh, and, you know, we <coughs> began with that in the 1990s. Here we are back. Uh, for the third straight year in a row, Somalia is the number one on this, this joint list produced by the Fund for Peace and Foreign Policy as the most failed state. Uh, it's also the title of, of Jim's terrific and very insightful piece, uh, In the Beginning There Was Somalia, which is about the dilemma of U.S. policy toward failed states. So I won't clunk up the discussion anymore, but uh, we'll hope to hear uh, from each of our panelists today and then make sure that we get plenty of time in for all of your questions as well. So I thought we'd go ahead and start with uh, Pauline who can give us an overview of um, you know, where we're coming from in this, in this joint project. Thank you very much, Susan. I thought you set that up very nicely. Um, I want to start with just a couple of opening remarks about the purpose of the failed state index and uh, what it tells us. Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer, actually, to call it the failed state index, because a lot of people just jump to the conclusion, okay, anybody on this list is a failed state, which is different degrees of failure. Um, and the top 60 are published in the Foreign Policy magazine. We actually do 177 countries. You can get the scores for those on our website as well. But in fact, it's an index of conflict risk. Uh, with 12 indicators that tell you about how the country is doing uh, 
indicator by indicator in terms of these indicators being drivers of conflict. They're actually pressures on the state. And you also have to look at the capacity of the state to deal with them. And one of the benefits you get from the focus on this year's index is the role of leaders, uh, which really tells you, does the state have the capacity uh, to deal with these problems? Not only the leaders, but the institutional capacity to respond to them. So uh, not every country on this list is a failed state, but what the implication is is that if the leaders and the institutions cannot cope with these pressures, then ultimately uh, becoming a failed state certainly is a possibility and a high risk. So this measures it, and it attempts to measure it using social science techniques and modern communication uh, technology. Most of our data comes from uh, electronic data on open source. Uh, and then we also use quantitative data and subject matter expertise. It goes through a very rigorous process. But um, the other factor that I think we've reached now since we're in our sixth uh, edition of this is we've now produced it uh, in a sufficient number of times that we're getting real trend lines. So that a lot of countries tend to read it and just look at it and compare themselves, oh, I'm better than such and such. Or uh, Lithuania just issued a statement saying, gee, we're doing really very well and we're better than this state and this state. The real uh, problem here, the real insights, I think, that come from the index is comparing a country to itself. That is, look at the trend lines over time. We have country profiles on our website which actually give you some of those historical data. So you can see whether the countries are doing better or doing worse. We had, I think, two years ago a very interesting outcome where Lebanon and Liberia, for example, had roughly the same score. Well, that's not the real story. The real story is that one was a good news story and one was a bad news story. Because Lebanon started much higher and after the war with Israel, it was going down. Whereas Liberia, which started from a very low point, just recovering from a civil war, was getting better. So the score itself is not important, it's the trend line. Um, so look at it historically and you can find that data on our websites. Um, and then I want to pick up on something that Susan said. Um, which I think uh, James is going to go into uh, a bit more. And that is that there is a consensus now from top leaders in both parties that the problem of failing states is a major national security issue for the United States. Um, this was first declared in 2002. Uh, it is certainly something that uh, Secretary of Defense Gates has reiterated over the years even to the point of trying to lobby for more money for the State Department so the U.S. would have a better capacity to respond. Yet the major failing of the United States is that we have no strategy to deal with failing states, none. We deal with it in a very fragmented way. Uh, it's stovepiped. We don't even use the same terminology. We don't have the same metrics uh, to assess either the capacity or a vulnerability to failure, uh, nor uh, measuring progress when there is an intervention. Uh, the latest national security uh, strategy that was just issued really is evidence of that. I read it very carefully, and I marked where it may have been referencing failing states. And it's just a few paragraphs, and it's very vague, and there isn't really uh, an overall strategy or a political military plan of what happens. In addition, we tend to segment it into pre-conflict and post-conflict responses. And the two don't often match. So we don't really look at the total life cycle of a conflict. Uh, you really can't do post-conflict reconstruction unless you really know the drivers that put that country into that condition in the first place. Um, and so you have to look at the whole life cycle of the conflict. So. Um, I feel very strongly, and, and, and there were some copies of an article that I had written uh, for PRISM um, that I think we ran out of now, but uh, I can give it to you if any of you want it. Um, really arguing that what we really need to do now is to develop a strategy. We have to elevate this issue, at least to the level of climate change or nonproliferation um, or energy dependence, <coughs> because so many of the other issues that we deal with, whether it's terrorism, lack of development, uh, immigration, refugees, uh, uh, drugs, uh, etc., come from states that don't have the capacity to either prevent these problems or deal with them on their own. And this policy should be a policy not of just reaction, 
as we tend to do once you have violence breaking out. It should be a strategy that tries to prevent states from failing. We now have measures, whether it's the failed state index or others, and there's a whole lot of knowledge that the academic and think tank community has produced, which tell us a lot about what we have learned in the past, but it's not been codified, it hasn't been pulled together for really policy-making proje projects, except, for example, preventing genocide or R2P or something like that. And those still are reactions, and it's not really a strategy of prevention. So I'm hoping that the next national security policy will do a bit better and uh, really address the problem of failing states in a more coherent and strategic manner. Well, I think that's, that's actually a perfect place uh, for Jim to pick up his, his piece, as I mentioned, sort of talks about this, this conundrum of U.S. policy for, for really going on two decades now, uh, you know, beginning and ending with the notion <coughs> Uh, that it's a critical security challenge, but not necessarily, you know, having the right either organization, as Pauline pointed out, or plan of attack. And of course, Afghanistan uh, is the big subject of the day where that comes from. And there's there's really some news hidden in your piece uh, too, Jim, which maybe you can share with everyone. Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you all for coming. Uh, rather than recap what was in my piece, I thought I would just talk a little bit about. The, in effect, the framework within which policy on failed states is, is made. And what Pauline emphasized was the analytical failures, both of this administration and of previous administrations, to come to grips with this problem. So let me talk about it in slightly different terms. First of all, even to say having a policy on failed states is something like saying you need to have a policy on pancreatic cancer. We know we don't know how to cure it. We know that it's an incredibly terrible problem. We know that we need to do something about it. And so we say, what's wrong with you? How come you haven't got a good policy? It has something to do with the intrinsic nature of the problem. The failure of a failed state is a very deep-rooted thing. And I think what makes it so difficult to address from the point of view of a policymaker, whether American or otherwise, is that a failed state is not just, and, and maybe not even principally, uh, an economic problem. Obviously, if you superimpose, say, the UN Human Development Report on top of the failed states index, you're going to find an enormous amount of overlap. Oh, all of the most, the top ten failed states are extremely poor states. But there are a fair number of extremely, uh, of states that score very badly. I forget whether you should say high or low, but let's say high score is bad. bad. High is bad. High is bad. Okay. So <laughs> states that score high, uh, that are significantly less poor in terms of GDP per capita than those states that score quite well. I mean, Pakistan and Sudan are significantly more wealthy in terms of GDP per capita than, let's say, Mali and, and Ghana. So clearly there is a huge element here of governance, politics, political leadership. And there are uh, a number of extremely poor countries that are relatively stable, mostly though not wholly democratic, that are not failed states. There are a number of not grossly impoverished states, by the worst possible standards, that are dreadfully governed, mostly autocratic, but, but not altogether. Uh, and so it is this fundamentally political problem that makes it such a difficult issue for policymakers to grasp. And I think this administration is extremely conscious of, thoughtful about, and I think will be sort of increasingly proactive towards developmental problems considered as such. Uh, so that when you hear Rajiv Shah of, of, of USAID talk about we're going to take the best practices from the poverty action lab and so forth, and, and, and we're going to uh, uh, ensure country ownership of development practices, these are the kinds of thoughtful practices that are required for what is an intrinsically difficult thing, which is to say, doing what you can do to help economic development in profoundly impoverished places. It's also very important in terms of preventing failed states in the sense that Pauline mentioned. That is to say, you need to be able to think, what can we do for a country like, let's say, Bangladesh, which is a relatively stable country, which has terrible problems that have made it in the past a much more unstable place, could make it so in the future. Those are in many ways developmental issues. But that doesn't get us to the fundamental political problem of failed states. And of course, to put it bluntly, uh, 
if you have a leader who is in, whose own calculus of self-interest is utterly destructive for the state in question, which obviously is true of many of those states at the very, very top, Afghanistan, Chad, Sudan, and so forth, then to, to ask, what is it that an American administration can do? You have to begin by recognizing the extreme difficulties of getting in between a, a ruthless leader and his own calculus of, of, of self-interest. Uh, and I don't think that the administration has begun thinking through that issue in the same sense that they are thinking through the development, de developmental issues. And so Susan mentioned Afghanistan. Well, Afghanistan is the, the quintessential case of the failed state, which is not only failing because of profound poverty. Afghanistan, if you look at it over the last half century, would have been going up and down had there been a failed states index, though its GDP per capita has remained abysmal that whole time. Its problems now obviously have to do with the insurgency, bad government, corruption, and so forth. And so the ongoing failure of the American effort in Afghanistan, the, the counterinsurgency effort, and you can think of counterinsurgency as a failed state strategy for the most gravely failed states where on top of all of the other problems, you have an insurgency, and so the only way you can address the problems that are leading to the failure is to first address the security problems which are driving it deeper and deeper into failure. So I, I think in the case of Afghanistan, you look at a situation where President Karzai seems to be fighting a completely separate war from the counterinsurgency war that the Americans would like to see him fight and are themselves fighting. Karzai has a vision of what he wants to do, which probably is to create some sort of coalition government bringing in uh, uh, Taliban forces that he would then run, which is wholly separate from the things he would have to do and the United States would like to see him do in order to address the root causes of state failure which is to say going after corruption, a focus on genuine governance, bringing governance down to the local level, decentralizing power, all the kinds of things that he would have to do. And, and there, it seems to me there has been a, a failure to use the leverage that we have in order to press Karzai to focus on those things which we, I think, rightly recognize are the causes of ongoing state failure so that we can succeed militarily in a lot of ways. Uh, we maybe will start doing better in March. Maybe the Kandahar offensive will prove to be not as bad as people think. But if we can't deal with the underlying political problems, which in this case, as in any case, means if we cannot persuade, nurture, press, help, etc the state itself to address these problems, because we can't address political problems for Afghanistan or any other state, then it seems to me failure is, is, is foreordained. Uh, I'm not sure what piece of news Susan was thinking of, but, but uh, when I talked to Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the head that of piece. policy, that was it? That piece, oh, yes. thank God. Was that what, yes? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> Who's the head of policy planning at the State Department? And I said, well, okay, what's your, what's your model for, mm -hmm. for addressing failed states? And she said, well, of course, first Afghanistan. And then she said, but also Haiti. Haiti is our other petri dish. And that's a very interesting example. Haiti has many of the same problems at the same level of intensity of Afghanistan, but without the insurgency. And so a as, a, as a, a paradigm, as a site uh, in years to come, the attempt to do nation building in the most fundamental sense in Haiti may be a less impossible, I don't want to say fair, or less impossible uh, laboratory of nation building possibilities than Afghanistan, which strikes me as the most difficult one possible. So let me, let me stop there. Well, Steve, I can't wait to get your perspective on this. Uh, I'm sure there's lots to mix it up on. Amory Slaughter's point is, is a good one for you to start on, perhaps, which is to say, is Afghanistan uh, and should it be the, the model for U.S. policy toward failed states? Is it truly the, the Petri dish? Uh, and, and more broadly, what, what is your take on what the right sort of U.S. approach toward, toward failed states should be? Well, uh, first of all, um, I want to commend you for another great issue. It's a tremendous issue. And also the partnered articles are just um, absolutely terrific. I love Jim's piece. And 
and the index. Is, are, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, just a couple of quick reactions. One about Anne Marie's, um, the issue with Anne Marie Slaughter and, and talking about Afghanistan. I happen to be a guest right now at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence, which is having this fantastic forum up in New York. Lots of it is off the record. I've just been in the AFPAC session uh, all day. I, I made everyone cheer uh, when I showed them that Afghanistan was number six and Pakistan was number 10 on the failed states list uh, so that we were not, um, you know, all just uh, talking about nothing here. But, but, I mean, frankly, after the discussion we've had, I became away so depressed because you realize there's not only an inchoateness in terms of America's direction and strategy, uh, even though you have a lot of good people working on it, if you talk to the generals, if you talk to the intelligence people, if you talk about the nation builders, if you talk to people at the National Security Council, they have very different uh, scripts that they seem to be working from, despite having gone through one of the largest strategic reviews um, in U.S. foreign policy since 1965. So if I, I think what Pauline um, Baker said was vital a moment ago, which we're still in reaction mode, that we're not... Uh, engaged in serious strategy. And one of the reasons I like the transparency about the index and what we're looking at is it helps uh, to give folks a portal into to begin thinking in a more systematic and serious way about what factors really drive failed states and what doesn't. My problem in the broad global justice community um, and, and the kind of the liberal uh, global justice community is is I think a lack of precision, and, and while there may be good sentiment to do things, you may in fact be doing, uh, we may be engaging in policies that exacerbate problems. A um, couple of the standouts here, just, just real quickly. When I look at the list of 20, uh, and I haven't gone into the broad, broad list, it's very clear that Africa, which we've known for a long time, is, is bordering on a failed continent. 12 of your 20 are on the African continent, and um, Jim Trout and others have done a you know, look at the working of the weaknesses in these states, and it's becoming a larger and larger problem, but Africa was a standout. Pakistan, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what Pauline said, that you know, don't, don't get too, too thrown off by, by Pakistan just appearing or any one country appearing in a certain place, but the question of Pakistan is a nuclear power, and when you compare to who's just a little bit above it and who's a little bit below it, it's scary to see Pakistan so prominently displayed uh, on this list. One of the things I was surprised by in their absence were the absence other than Afghanistan of the other stands, Kyrgyzstan uh, in, in particular, and a lot of the other sort of smaller Caucasus uh, region nations, I would suspect that are going to be moving unless you get some sort of major shift uh, in the Steve, we're having a few technical difficulties. Hey, Steve, we're having a few technical difficulties, so I'll... Uh, uh, civil society. I think he hears you. Yes, he is, he doesn't hear you while he's okay. talking. Steve, can you hear us? We're I can hear you fine. We're having a few problems uh, hearing you. We're sort of getting interrupted, so maybe we'll go back and uh, get the others to respond. <laughs> okay. Well, my, my apologies uh, on the sound. I hope this would work out okay. Um, well, thank you. I've got more to add, but I will put it on the blog, and we'll link it to foreign policy, and, and congratulations on a great, um, on a, on a, uh, great issue. Well, I think the, uh, your point is an excellent one, actually, about what's going to be moving up next year. Central Asia is... I don't know if underrepresented is the right word. Certainly, <laughs> it's, it's, it's probably the case that uh, next year, which will reflect the events of 2010, you know, Kyrgyzstan and probably Tajikistan as well, uh, will be looking uh, you know, to be so more if unstable. The, if the sound is working okay for a moment, there's one other key point I'd like to make. Sure. Um, Jim focuses a little bit on the Secretary's Coordinator for Reconstruction and... Um, stabilization. And there is a battle going on in the U.S. government that's part of the, um, I guess, quadrennial uh, defense, or not, not defense, diplomacy and development review, which, which Anne Marie Slaughter is involved in. And that is what to do with essentially our efforts to train and staff uh, government apparatchiks and whatnot to play a more vital role 
in stabilization and reconstruction. And I've been impressed with the work of this group. But the latest trends are to take this group, uh, which has been the largest growing budget item and largest building capacity of the State Department, and put it in USAID. That's one of the big proposals. And USAID is not what people may think it is. USAID, even though headed by Rajiv. Steve, systems we lost you again. Yeah? yeah? We're sort of losing you again. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm sending too many bits at the same time. In any case, I will write it up. Susan, <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, sorry this didn't work as well as I'd hoped. Uh, no, thanks for your contribution, Steve. That's great. Um, Jim, do you want to jump in there? Because I think this is an important point about, like, maybe you can sketch out just quickly for us, what is this map of, of the U.S. Uh, approach to failed states, just in concrete terms? The State Department, is it their fault, or is it just something that's fallen outside of the realm of their possibility? Well, let me just explain this whole question of capacity, because, uh, and, and Pauline began to speak to this as well, uh, which is if you think, as this administration does, that this is the preeminent problem, or at least a major problem, it is clearly the kind of problem that cannot be attacked only through classic diplomatic or, for that matter, military means. You need the capacity to do things. That means you need people who actually can go out and do whatever it is you say needs to be done in failed states. And so, again, Afghanistan. The, uh, the Obama administration decided in March of 2009 that they would triple, this is even before the decision about the surge in, at the end of 2009, that they would triple the number of civilians who were in Afghanistan from 300 to 900, and even more importantly, disperse them into the countryside. They'd all basically been in, in Kabul, working with central ministries and so forth. Okay, where do you get them from? The answer is there are no such people. Now, since 2004, there has been, and, and really going back before, but since 2004, inside the White House, there has been continual conversation about this question of operational capacity. Where <coughs> should it be located? Who do we need? How do we generate it? Very little has happened. The, the department Steve mentioned, which is the State Department Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization, was stood up in 2004, had no funding, basically got by by kind of begging money from the Defense Department. Uh, finally now has begun to hire people. Far too late, far too few to be able to satisfy this civilian surge. And so what then happened is the State Department AID began to hire people. From where? You, well, you put out a request, people, people apply, and you take what's available because you don't have time to wait. And so, for example, at, at AID, uh, they did not say, we need an agriculture specialist who really knows a lot about, I don't know, winter wheat. No, no, no. They, they hired people. If you got over the hurdle, they hired you, and then they figured out where to put you. Well, that is not a policy. That's just a, a, a desperate attempt to cope with an impossible situation. So, so just to sort of put it in a framework, there is a pressing need to create a, a cadre of people equivalent to the magnitude of the problem that the administration has now described. Well, and also, I just I have to say, I've found it astonishing ever since you first sent in the first draft of this article that the administration would say that Afghanistan is or could possibly be the petri dish for a more global strategy toward failed states. When you look at the scale of the investment, the United States has been fighting a war there since 2001. How many billions and billions and billions of dollars you know, has the United States spent in Afghanistan? Now we're spending actually a very significant amount in Haiti next door as well, which is the other state they mentioned. I'm just looking and going down this list, and I'm, I see Pauline here you know, nodding her head. So the top 10 you know, states on this list are Somalia, Chad, Sudan, Zimbabwe, Democratic Republic of Congo, then Afghanistan, Iraq, Central African Republic, Guinea, and Pakistan. So toward how many of those is the United States prepared to invest comparable amounts of money to that which is being invested in Afghanistan? It's, it's almost inconceivable to me. We're not even actually prepared to invest that much money in Afghanistan, and we're in there. So 
you know, again, what what does that really mean in terms of, you know, in real terms to call Afghanistan the, the petri dish for U.S. policy? Well, it's, it's a big mistake on two counts. First of all, you're trying to develop a policy based on its hardest case. To continue the metaphor that, that Jim had uh, cited, it would be like a doctor saying, uh, we're going to do research on cancer, taking the most advanced terminal patients that we can, rather than see the whole picture. Um, and I'm not saying that Afghanistan is a terminal case, but it's clearly one of the hardest cases. And he's right about Haiti being a very different kind of thing. Some people have proposed that rather than invest all our funds in the hardest cases, that maybe in terms of prevention anyway, we should look at the, the orange level, the next level under, because those are countries that have problems, but they also have some assets that, that we can work with. But getting back also to Afghanistan, I have a problem with developing a strategy based on petri dishes. Mm -hmm. uh, you are by definition then just doing on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. You're not, you don't have an overall picture of, of the whole plan. You don't even put Afghanistan into a broader picture and say what's doable uh, in the broader scope and then what's doable in this specific case. So you are strapping yourself to an approach which creates all the obstacles that one could have without saying, okay, there are certain things we can do. And it's not just the U.S. Part of a strategy has to be how we work with other countries and other organizations and what can be done to stop this constant rotation of jumping from crisis to crisis to crisis and then saying, okay, we failed in each case. Well, maybe we didn't fail. Maybe in some cases we got a good enough outcome. Uh, you know, and we have a lot of confusion too. You know, we confuse nation building with state building. It's not the same thing. We confuse interagency cooperation with a strategy. It's not. That's operational. A strategy is what to do. Um, and it, by responding the way we do, particularly with the SCRS uh, example, the State Department, by, by looking to when that was created, it was supposed to be the bureaucratic home of dealing with failing states. Analytically, operationally, it was supposed to map out the whole thing. It has now been reduced to basically an agency which is cr recruiting people for manpower shortages that other agencies have. So if there are some election monitors they need here or they need some agriculturalists there on a particular project, they're responding also on a crisis basis but just filling gaps in other agencies' activities, mostly the military but some State Department as well. So it's lost the broad picture. Now, it's accomplished a lot in just six years in terms of, first of all, I think Congress and uh, the administration um, pushed it in that direction. And when it was formed, it was formed on the basis of appealing for resources on a contingency basis, prevention. Congress doesn't like that, particularly in hard economic times. Why plan for the future when we've got needs for the present? So we have to make that case that planning for the future is really a very important thing or we're going to just hop around from Afghanistan to Iraq to Afghanistan to Iraq uh, uh, to Hades to, to East Timors, et cetera, and never really step back, as I think Susan said, that at least the index tries to get you to do to look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. So I just think the approach is all wrong. Mm -hmm. Let, let me say a something? couple things. Uh, let me maybe defend the Petri dish for a second. Uh, I think the premise that Anne-Marie Slaughter had when she used that metaphor was there's some formula here. There's some generic approach which obviously changes with every country. If, if the Bush administration's petri dish was Iraq, then the formula is regime change and then let them pick up the pieces. Or to be a little more charitable, you could say the formula was democracy promotion. Uh, in a place like Egypt, and that didn't work very well either. So I, I think, uh, I mean, I know from talking to them that, that what Obama policymakers would say is that we are inheriting a really one-dimensional approach to these problematic states, and we need to think in a much more comprehensive way about what the military calls complex operations, where you have a security component, and you obviously have a development component, and you have a very important uh, governance political component, and you have a diplomatic component where you're dealing with others. And so uh, I, I, I know 
what they would say is that there are important congruences between Haiti and, uh, and Afghanistan. If you think, for example, diplomatically, in the case of Afghanistan, we have got to find a way of bringing in neighboring countries, which we have not done in a very effective way until now. If you think about Haiti, the security component comes from the UN and above all from, from Brazil, which is the big peacekeeping nation there. There is a big security component. We're not the ones who are supplying it. So, so that's right. I mean, and, and as Anne Marie said, we need to think coherently about this as a specific problem, varying though it does from place to place. Uh, and, and I think there is an ongoing effort to do that, though we're rather at the beginning of it now. I think in the case of this agency, this entity we're talking about, SCRS as it's called, um, and it's absolutely right that now it's just a place, you pick up the telephone, you call SCRS, you say, uh, hi, this is the State Department, we, we got to have five guys to go to southern Sudan because they're going to have a new government in January and we don't know what the hell is going on there. And so they'll then send five guys who actually are trained for this, unlike what I was describing in terms of Afghanistan, these people are hired for extremely specific purposes and have expertise. Should this may be too insidery a question, but it's one we've been batting around. Should they have more autonomy? Should they not simply be the ones on the other end of the telephone? Maybe they shouldn't. I, I'm pretty sure the way things are shaping up, though, is that there is a, a big effort on the part of the administration to make USAID, uh, let me put it this way, to, to install a brain in USAID, <laughs> um, which, which allegedly they had until the Bush administration eliminated their policy planning bureau in 2006. Um, so with quite a bit of fanfare, Rajiv Shah has created, recreated, uh, a bureau, it's not called policy planning like it's state. Policy planning is one of four or five different elements. Anyway, the point is that, that it is an AID, I believe, that the administration intends to have the comprehensive thinking about these problems done. And therefore, insofar as there's going to be some zero-sum power relationship between AID and this other body, the SCRS, AID is going to come out on top. Well, I think, I mean, just from one perspective, right, it sounds like what you're describing is an intent to have a policy uh, rather yeah. than a policy. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I wanted to pull back, you know, actually from that, that starting point for a second and say that's a pretty overwhelming list of countries with, you know, problems that, you know, all of us, you know, viscerally can react to when we look at that, that top ten list. Uh, the theme of our issue, bad guys, right? So. Let's do a little bit of, uh, you know, name calling, a little bit of finger pointing. This is not a polite subject, right? And so far, we've been having actually a pretty polite conversation about it. That's one of the challenges, I think, when you're talking and writing about countries like this. We are talking about, you know, extremes of despair. Not just, this is not just a poverty list, right? We're talking about extremes of despair often in many cases married with either a pre or post conflict situation we're talking about you know what happens when uh, everybody in essence throws up their hands why is it that we as a group cannot uh, identify what is the United States policy toward Chad second on the list here today you know the answers we don't know or at least you know I, I don't maybe maybe there is one um, so I guess I'd ask each of you, and then I'm hoping our audience will, will jump into this as well. Besides the United States and its obvious, you know, if often well-intentioned <coughs> struggles to, to produce a more coherent, uh, you know, policy and worldview toward, toward these countries, it, obviously a very difficult task. But putting aside the United States, when you look at the incredible and very depressing sort of durability of those few countries that have dominated the top of this list since uh, since you started it. Uh, I believe it's 15 countries have shared the top 10 spots uh, over the last six years. So it's a, it's a pretty depressingly constant list of names we're faced with. You know, what are some of the factors that, that you think are most responsible? Is it, you know, just terrible leadership? How, how high up do our bad guys uh, rank for you, Pauline? And then I'll ask you the same. Well, you know, one of the things that is that, that suggests, that fact that you pointed to suggests, is that uh, you know, it's much easier to, to destroy than it is to build. Once countries get into that spiral of descent, 
very hard to pull them back up, even if, the, if a lot of the causes are <coughs> human nature, like Haiti, with you know, the victim of a, a, a very poor country, ill-governed country, yet it's hit by an earthquake, uh, and it's even worse than it ever was before, due to no fault of its own. Um, so it's much harder to pull a country up once it's been down, yet it has been done. As I said before, the Liberia instance, for example, uh, and some other UN uh, countries that uh, have sort of graduated up from the really bottom of the barrel to a, to a recovery uh, trend line. Um, but clearly leadership and bad governance is, is a major factor. Um, you have a problem in a lot of these states, and we've been talking about failed states as a developmental problem. The heart of it, and I think Jim agrees with me on this, is that it's really a political problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you can't have development and you can't have security if you have poor governance. Uh, worse, if you have malevolent government. And in many of these states you do. Now, if you take one of these countries on that list, for example, Zimbabwe, uh, it wasn't a great administration when it became independence because they had a lot of human rights violations and civil strife. But the economic policies actually were quite good. Um, and it was only later on that Mugabe began to get even more and more repressive, and then he even attacked the economy, and then the country went into a nosedive. So uh, sometimes we want stability at the cost of bad governance. Um, so stability is not always what we're looking for. We're really looking for good governance. Um, the magazine goes <coughs> very deeply into some of these really bad leaders. Um, what we haven't uh, dealt with is how do we deal with bad leaders? Um, you know, we tried military overthrow. That doesn't work very much. It goes against our democracy right. chant. Uh, we never know what to do even after there's regime change. In some countries, we were very afraid of radical regime change. For example, if it happened in Pakistan or it happened in North Korea. Uh, and we haven't mentioned North Korea, and that's also in the top 60. And they're going to go through a leadership change soon. Uh, clearly, that is a state with very poor governance. Um, and the stakes there are so high. Um, and so we have a policy toward North Korea, as we well should, but do we really look at it in the context of a failed state? Mm -hmm. um, and what that means? We certainly didn't do it in the case of Iraq. That's right. That's right. And so we were totally uh, ill-prepared. We also tend to look at failed states solely from a military perspective sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's why Afghanistan is not the best petri dish, even if we wanted to use that, because really, the issue there in the total debate today is the nature of the counterinsurgency strategy. Um, and even if the counterinsurgency strategy worked, however that would be defined, there would be no cat Taliban, no security threats, Afghanistan would still be a basket case because you haven't addressed some of the other problems and the other drivers, so there could be a relapse. So we have to have a holistic view to these and not have a unidimensional, it's either a developmental problem or a military problem, or a governance problem. It's all of those. And you just have to sort out which, it is, which are they in any particular state, and which are the drivers in their long term and short term that we can do something about in the short term while working in the long term. I think Pauline has also just described the limits of policy in a question like this. That is, when we talk about the need for capacity, for example, all those guys, women, whatever, we're gonna, people are going to send in. That's only in states where a United States role is welcome. So, yes, Afghanistan, yes, Haiti, no Zimbabwe, no a lot of places. And so, in those places, what kind of leverage do we have? And so, Zimbabwe is clearly one example where the government, the state was essentially destroyed as an intentional byproduct of malevolent governance. Mm -hmm. There was very little the United States could do. There was never any question of certainly mounting a military intervention there. There was virtually no question of attempting to sponsor one on anybody else's part. Our diplomatic leverage had already disappeared. In many of these countries, the United States has already imposed sanctions on the malevolent administration in question. Same was true in Sudan. Same was true in Burma. And so then you depend on neighbors. And this is a serious diplomatic problem because in most of these cases, Zimbabwe and Sudan are two obvious ones. Uh, for the neighbors, the issue tends to be much more the protecting the sovereignty of the state, 
or protecting the, the prerogatives of the neighborhood or of the continent than it does liberating the people in that country from the yoke of oppression. And so uh, in the case of Zimbabwe, there was only just so much the United States could do to exert pressure. A more complicated example is the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there's a huge international presence, uh, both in the form of peacekeepers and millions of NGOs, economic development, and so forth, all essentially disappearing into quicksand. Uh, because of a whole bunch of problems, but above all, a terrible president who, in fact, has been profiled in, in foreign policy right now, uh, uh, Joseph Kabila. We do have leverage on Kabila. I think there's been some reluctance to use it. When I say we in this case, I mean the international community more than the United States. Uh, you often find there is a greater willingness to pour peacekeepers into a country than there is to apply the kind of politi political leverage you need uh, when you have a head of state who is quite indifferent to the sufferings of his people. Those are much harder questions than either send in the Marines or even send in USAID. That is the uh, adroit but, but focused and persistent use of diplomacy. So the United Nations, they're one of our bad guys in the, in the magazine issue for exactly this reason. There's a pretty long history of you know, uh, what one could term not too politely dictator coddling by the United Nations. What, what is their mandate and their mission, if not that? I mean, as you pointed out, <coughs> billions of dollars are spent. And in fact, there are, I believe, more peacekeepers stationed in more places around the world today than, than ever before. Uh, well, you, and have, you have two faces of the UN. You have the UN, right. particularly General Assembly, uh, Human Rights Council, et cetera, that do the dictator coddling. And then you have the, uh, the agencies of the UN that do a lot of good work. Right. Uh, you have the Security Council that does occasionally act. Um, and you have a whole peacekeeping uh, area. And you have uh, uh, other efforts like uh, the Office of the Special Advisor to Prevent Genocide. So there are initiatives in the UN that uh, relate to the whole issue of prevention uh, and prevention of failing states and mass atrocities. But then you have the politics of the world and, and nations uh, protecting their own interests. I want to mention in relation to that another complication in dealing with neighbors, which is something we tend to do. Neighbors are not always the ones that are most anxious to solve the problems of their next door partners. Right. Because they're the first to be impacted in case things go wrong. So if you look at South Korea, they don't really want to provoke anything that could result in the North coming down and refugees pouring over. South Africa has the key to the Zimbabwe issue. Could Bradley set up the Southern African Development uh, uh, Court Council to really do something on Zimbabwe? But they too uh, are very afraid of the impact of refugees. They've already had riots internally from Zimbabweans who've come across the border mm -hmm. uh, and have taken jobs away from, from local people. So the neighbors are maybe the best coddlers of all, mm -hmm. rather than the ones that actually create a cocoon of change, you might say. Um, so that's another conundrum for US policy. And we tend not to want to do things in opposition to neighborhood watches. Um, so it's another, it's another difficulty, which is another reason why we need strategies, and rather than just strategies. Well, I'd like to offer at least two cheers for the UN. Um, Pauline mentioned Liberia, for example, as a country which has gotten a whole lot better. Well, it's gotten a whole lot better in no small part because of the massive UN peacekeeping presence. The same is true with Sierra Leone. Uh, there are other countries where I would say things would be worse were it not for peacekeeping presences. Uh, and so that's a very important instrument. The UN also has legitimacy in terms of acting inside countries, which no individual state will have, and which God knows the United States will not have. And I think that we need to, we've reached that. And of course, a big part of the national security strategy was the international order, working with the international order, specifically fortifying the UN. So, for example, the UN development program, in terms of actual money, relatively weak. Nothing like major Western donors, nothing for that matter like the World Bank. But UNDP in recent years has recognized they have to focus on governance and democracy. It is easier 
for a UN official to go to a parliamentary official in Nigeria and say, we want to help you become more effective, more transparent, and so forth, than it is for someone from USAID to do so. And so UNDP has that mission. Uh, they have the people on the ground. It's, it's a relatively weak effort. But I think it would behoove us in thinking about these kinds of interventions, these peaceful interventions, to recognize that the UN will be able to go places and say things that we can't. They also have diplomatic clout, uh, not just at the operational level, but the high level. And one example is when uh, Kofi Annan uh, went to Kenya when the riots uh, erupted after the election. Now, that wasn't <coughs> prevention in, in the sense of preventing the outbreak of violence, but it certainly was containment. He was no longer Secretary General at that point. I he know, was but, he was, uh, but it was his UN credentials that allowed him to do it. And, and there are a lot of other emissaries that the UN could use and call upon to do it. The problem is that once you get that, people think the problem's over. Right. And they walk away, and the structural problems are still there. Kenya is just as vulnerable now as it was before the last election. Right. The same thing could happen in Kenya. Uh, you spoke about Africa. Africa is coming up now with several elections in the next two, three years. Mm -hmm. And elections are known to be conflict-inducing events all over the world, but in particular in Africa. Mm -hmm. Have we got a policy toward that? Mm -hmm. Are we preparing for that? What could we do now to, to contain the, the kinds of violence that we know that can erupt in these countries? These are flashpoints. We know things like that in advance. But we really don't have the time we're bogged down in two wars. We're doing, you know, the QDDR and so forth. When the real world is out there saying, hey, uh, we've got problems here. You can act now. Yeah. Uh, but that would be something, and then the UN is very useful there because one of the things they have done with a very credible record is to run a good elections. I think that's a perfect point, in fact, to have our audience jump in and start to share with us some of their questions about uh, the bigger picture. I'm going to ask everybody who uh, asked a question to stand up and let us know what your name is and what group you're coming from, too. So, okay, right here. Yep. It's hard to see these Hi, thank you very much. William Seymour, International Peace Quest Institute. Um, I'll apologize in advance that what I say is or ask is going to be pretty cynical, but um, you were talking about how it's easier to destroy than to build. Um, I mean, would it be easier to wait until countries have completely collapsed before intervening? Just in terms of the fact that um, Afghanistan still has a, because the government was still in place, um, they had a very vibrant insurgency now because they're still, they're still an organized force. And there are places that it's, it would be really hard to just move in and you'd have to actually remove these leaders who in the past have been almost impossible to get rid of smoothly, uh, replace smoothly while in a place like Somalia where the country had essentially fallen apart already, the initial progress was actually quite good. And although it later fell apart due to a poor understanding of the local conditions, that would have been, you know, a greater amount of study could have prolonged and fixed maybe the, uh, the issues that we ran into. So would it be better to focus, to wait on some of these um, sort of worse off cases until they, they do fall apart um, and then go in? with uh, a more comprehensive, build that up from the ground approach. Well, in fact, that's what we're doing in most of the cases. I mean, there's an awful lot of cases out there that the index identifies, <coughs> that there's very little going on in the international community to respond to. That's what we're talking about, about a strategy. Where, you know, if you have a, a well-thought-out strategy, you can't go everywhere, you can't do everything, and, and the way to do it is not to go in and overthrow leaders. What, the way to do it is to analyze the cases in such a way where you can identify what can be done in a positive way, what are the resources out there, uh, and how to do it in a systematic, planned way. Now, what you were suggesting is, a, is something that someone had suggested before. Let these um, conflicts just burn themselves out. Uh, well, you might, you might argue that from a, a very distant, abstract theoretical perspective, but real lives are at stake here. And I think there's a moral issue uh, of if you know that you could do something to intervene to save lives, I think there's a moral obligation to very seriously consider it. And then secondly, in picking and choosing, uh, 
you have to say, well, if it's just a unilateral policy or a response, you have to take into account where's the U.S. interest. In the case of Afghanistan, we've defined that as a high interest because we were attacked from a non-governmental source uh, from that territory. We don't want the territory to be a launching pad again for attacks against the U.S. So Afghanistan is a special case. But there are going to be other Afghanistans out there that we're going to do nothing about. I'd say two things. One is, this is something that Edward Litwack, the theorist right. once, I guess, puckishly is the word, proposed when he wrote an article called, called Give War a Chance. Right. And the premise was, you can't stop these events, whether it's in Darfur or elsewhere, so allow the natural dynamic to work itself out, yes, and then come by and pick up the pieces. And I think, should we have done that, let's say, in Kenya, where, as, where as Pauline said, actually intervention prevented violence that took the lives of a thousand people from taking the lives of tens of thousands of people. How do you know where that dynamic is ineluctable? But secondly, there's a premise behind your question, but also in many ways behind what all of us are saying, which is a very American premise, which is we're going to go in there and stick our hands in there and fix this and fix that, and the question is how, when. Well, often the, your access to these places, your capacity to act, is extremely limited. And so it is, there is also a, a prudential decision about what can you do and what can you do without making things worse. So we're not necessarily talking about big, gross acts of intervention. We are often talking about things that are much more restrained because that's the best and the most we can do. Yes, here. Oh, Claire here in the front. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. I, I have sort of a simple numbers question. When you talk about bringing folks in to help, what's the, what's the appropriate ratio of people we're bringing in versus the number of people in the country? I mean, you can send some folks in, but if it's not enough, clearly they can't do very much. I think the answer is you don't need a lot of people. And not only do you not need a lot of people, you shouldn't have a lot of people. This is not the equivalent of the counterinsurgency principle that you need to have one peacekeeper for every 50 people, something like that. If we are talking about building up local capacity, because again, you cannot give people the rule of law, you can't give them justice, you can't give them development. You can help them help themselves, you can nurture things, you can start things. In that regard, the problem is not, say, in Afghanistan, that we only have 900 people where we need 9,000 people. The problem is we don't have 900 people who know what they're doing. So we didn't need more Peace Corps type folks? I am skeptical that that's the problem because I think that um, the, it is so crucial for us to be able to find the weavers whereby we can incentivize people, empower people, help them figure out how to do things right, that I don't know that we need to have a vast core of civilian operatives. We, I think we need to have a small, nimble, really well-trained and experienced core of people. It, it's, it's not the quantity, it's the quality of the assistance. And just to give you an example, and it's going to vary from country to country, obviously, but one of, the, one of the real needs in these countries uh, uh, that you see again and again that's not being addressed is to build up the police. Uh, because the first response is to use the military, which actually is supposed to defend the country against external threats. And so the military tends to under-respond uh, and overkill. Um, and we're very bad at police assistance generally because of the history in Latin America uh, and because of the nature of our own police forces. We don't have a national police force. They're all local. So where do we recruit from? Uh, we have to think this through. And it's not just we then. And some European countries are better equipped to do this. But there, the emphasis is you have to have a, an internal <coughs> security force that is professional, uh, regarded as legitimate, and regarded as representative of the government that can deal with at least the security problems of, of mass violence when it erupts. Um, and we tend not to give the kinds of assistance to end the culture of impunity so that when there are perpetrators of violence that are identified, they go to court uh, and they're dealt with. And that's another uh, common thing in, in weak and failing states, that people don't think they can get justice 
with their courts, with their own system. So they either turn to Sharia or they turn to another form of extremism or they lose total confidence in their government. So it's the, it's the core uh, functions of government that really need to be uh, 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 filled up. Now, you could do as much as you can on these, and in some countries you're not going to do nation building in the sense of uh, inspiring people to be loyal and have a common sense of nationhood. We can't do that. That's got to be done by good leaders uh, who set an example. Um, but what we can do, is, as, as James said, is help them help themselves. And if there is a, a government there that really wants to do that, we can come in and help them build police forces, help them build professional uh, budget uh, capacity, legislatures, etc. And they don't have to be in the Western model uh, at all. They can be, and we're learning too, about the varieties of assistance that we can get. But the central point is it's not the quantity, it's the quality of the assistance that we give. And it shouldn't be just an AID perspective because they have a development uh, perspective mainly, not a conflict resolution perspective. Well, and that's, I think that's an important point for everybody. If you just go back to look at what are the top dozen, you know, states that we're talking about here on this list, you know, virtually all of them are, you know, in the midst of or, you know, barely uh, a day or two out of, you know, serious shooting violence. And so, you know, it, to me that's a totally different conversation okay. a lot of these. Yes, right here. Uh, my name is <clears throat> the name will help. I've come from Pakistan. I'm a TV talk show host there. Uh, to me, it seems that uh, there's a very big gap between America's political and uh, military objectives and its uh, <clears throat> economic objective. In case of Pakistan, we are uh, a close ally of the United States, but uh, we are facing a very serious economic crisis. And uh, in the last few months, the United States has opposed um, Pakistan's efforts to develop its energy resources. Uh, we have some of the largest coal resources in Pakistan, which we were hoping to develop into energy resource for Pakistan. The United States has officially turned it down on environmental grounds. Uh, the United States has opposed Pakistan's signing of uh, gas pipeline with Iran, which is essential for our economic survival. And uh, America has also signed, uh, as we all know, a nuclear civil agreement with India, uh, which Pakistan also sought, but uh, we were not provided the same opportunity to develop. So it seems to me that, um, and on the other hand, there's another problem. Ambassador Robin Raphael, who's in charge of $1.5 billion uh, disbursement every year under the Kerry Luger program, uh, she is extremely frustrated in Pakistan. She cannot find... Um, avenue where they, these funds would be invested. Because the fact remains that we are in a war zone. Uh, America has been safe uh, since 9-11, but uh, in Pakistan the fire has continued to spread. And in the same way, I think the United States has tried to assert uh, or rather introduce uh, um, uh, a kind of democracy in Afghanistan to, uh, uh, which to me uh, seems to be failing completely. And I really don't see any possibility that these programs which you are talking about, or even the Peace Corps type of stuff, will ever succeed in the United States. So I just wanted <clears throat> to find out the reaction. Do you agree that there's a big gap uh, between the political perspective and the economic perspective of the U.S. administration? Well, I, I think you've identified two different, really serious problems. One is that precisely because we are now talking about development in a profoundly political context, that is to say that we are harnessing it to political goals, including goals of political reform, it means it's going to come into conflict with a series of other political goals. And so the gentleman mentioned a series of things that might be useful for Pakistan, but nevertheless the United States deems to be in some sense in conflict with national security or with other goods. So, for example, the, the, the wish of any number of developing countries to develop their, their coal industry is clearly a problem in terms of trying to reduce carbon footprints. So, uh, two goods come into, into conflict there. The, the question of the civil nuclear deal with India is a very neuralgic issue with Pakistan. It may have been a mistake, but the United States also was seeking to cultivate uh, relations with, with India. Um, so the, the good 
of development, in, especially in states that are thought of as being fragile and dangerous to American national security, is going to come into conflict with other things. The, the point about Robin Raphael, which I have also heard, which is, uh, correct me if I've, I've misunderstood this, uh, this is a large amount of money. It may not be uh, so much for a country as large as Pakistan, but it's a billion and a half, actually a total of two and a half billion dollars uh, a year for three years, but I guess one and a half billion in terms of these development projects. And, and as a matter of building up local capacity, uh, the U.S. Embassy is seeking to find local partners who can carry these out. Well, it turns out there are a limited number of such local partners. Many of the local partners are connected to local political parties, uh, and there's a wish not to uh, favor one political party as opposed to another, or they're seen as being corrupt or, or something. And so there is this notion now, uh, which you hear very much in development circles, and which I don't trivialize in the least, which is country ownership, local ownership. It can't be the United States imposing these things, not only because it inflames sovereign feelings, but also because the whole goal is building up local capacity. But what does that mean in, in, in the real world? Does it mean that you are, are dealing with local actors who actually don't have the ability or you don't trust? Uh, does it mean that you're going to forego more effective development because you think it's more important to build up local capacity? These are, these are big problems to which there is no answer. In fact, I know that this is one of those things that this sort of new brain trust inside AID is trying to to figure out. I have no kind of overarching answer to that. Do you want to read yeah, that? I would just add that I think that uh, when the U.S. is involved in conflict zones generally, there's bound to be contradictions within its own policy. Um, for example, one of the ones, again, that we're debating now is the expediency of allying with local insurgents or the Taliban on the one hand uh, in order to undermine the insurgency uh, versus state building on the other hand because when you do that and we did it in Iraq you basically create more militias which are going to challenge the use of force and the monopoly on the use of force of the, of the state. Um, so you have a conflict between security and political goals right there. Same thing with economic uh, policies. Uh, if you simply are fo focusing only on the economic goals, development, what's good for Pakistan in the long term, you're going to run against environmental concerns. You're going to run against other security concerns the United States has with, uh, with Iran, et cetera. It's inevitable when you have a large power like the United States with multiple global interests, uh, they're going to come into conflict. And, and we don't have a very good way of sorting those out. Uh, generally, security prevails. And the security interests tend to override the political and the economic interests. Uh, sorry, just one more. Uh, Karachi uh, has the biggest Pashtun population in the world, more than 3 million people. And I think we have about half a million Taliban, who are shopkeepers and, you know, truck drivers. They have their brothers and sisters, you know, cousins, uh, fighting in Afghanistan. And I speak to them quite regularly. Um, and believe me, uh, I think it's a big misconception in the United States. Taliban are not anti-American. They're anti-occupation. And um, but they, they say we had nothing to do with 9-11. We didn't even know it was happening or it was being planned. And we are being punished unjustly, I think, for what happened uh, in New York that uh, day in September. So I think uh, the Taliban, and they, are, uh, they, they provide you know, the big transportation business in Karachi, big uh, shopping centers, and uh, they're, they're very normal, decent people. They're not even um, as religiously bigoted as Mullah Omar, who I, uh, I think is an isolated person. But I think the, 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 uh, the American perspective need, needs to be refreshed on this account. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> Hi, uh, George Papadopoulos from uh, University College London School of Public Policy. Uh, my question uh, pertains to the, the topic of conversation, which was the bad guys. I understand that th these bad guys govern these countries. However, we have to look at the facts on the ground. In Somalia, even in a country like Egypt, which not a lot of people are talking about. Um, in these countries, through low governance and high corruption, we've essentially created non-state actors, radical Islamist groups, or it could be pacified Islamist groups, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which was in the beginning very radical and very uh, aggressive, 
and now more pacified through repression, etc. And now with the Al Shabaab movement, which basically controls ha half of Somalia, the ports, natural resources, the Gulf of Aden is right there, piracy. So basically, what I would like to know is how have high corruption levels and low governance created these non-state actors, and what can we possibly do now to fight their vying for public um, support? Because obviously, in the end of the day, no one's going anywhere without public support. You need it. You need logistics. You need somewhere to eat. You need recruits. So basically, I'm asking how do the two variables – how have they created these people? And now that they are on the ground, what can we do to prevent other followers essentially cutting off the public support when you have a basically a half ass government running, <laughs> running their countries and you have them essentially acting as a state within a state, which basically provides the only gover governance, subsidizes schools, roads, even though they have a malicious undertone to what they're trying to do. So it's a very complicated issue. I'm, I think you've identified a key factor which we haven't talked about enough, and that is the role of corruption in failing states. And it's a very, very important factor. Uh, because basically we found that high levels of corruption, particularly with poor social services, uh, delegitimizes the state, delegitimizes the government. And once you cross that threshold and you have an image of uh, basically oligarchs or dynasties uh, that are just feathering their own nests and basically stealing assets from the people, um, you, you're going to have a very, very explosive situation. How do we deal with it? Well, um, in the case of Somalia, it's, it's one of those hard cases where we really can't do very much because it's gone too far. In the cases of others uh, where I think we do have some leverage, I think the answer is in pressing for more openness and accountability, transparency and accountability. Um, and really, we have this real problem now in Afghanistan with corruption and the difficulty of pushing Karzai to really deal with it, but it's so embedded, including his own brother, uh, that you don't know how hard to push because you may destabilize Karzai. Uh, and then what would happen? Who would follow him? So you, you create the, the, the bed you have to sleep in here, and I think it's one of the most difficult problems that we deal with in, in weak and failing states. Well, let, let me just address a different part of the same question, which is the connection between injustice and terrorism. Now, this is something which the Obama administration agrees with the Bush administration on. Bush's famous second inaugural address, which is wh where he said, wherever it is that tyranny uh, reigns, all very grandiose language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, their terrorism will flourish because people will react to injustice by seeking a radical alternative. And so when, when Gates, when Robert Gates says that this is the greatest problem of our time, he essentially means the exact same thing, that, that these failing states create frustration and the frustration in turn creates terrorism. Now, in that same second inaugural address, Bush laid out this vision of democracy promotion. The solution to terrorism, the solution to the failed state which causes terrorism is democracy. Well, correct, but it turns out it's really hard to do. And so the Obama administration is seeking to find a more comprehensive, indirect, engaged, they would use lots of different words, way of addressing that. But the, the, the insight, I think, is correct. I think Bush's solution turned out to be ruinously wrong-headed. But the fact is that it, uh, these, these countries, there is a tight lid on them. It's actually remarkable that Egypt has not produced uh, a significant uh, terrorist threat since the 1960s when Qutub and others were uh, flourished in the Egyptian jails and ultimately were the people who murdered Sadat. And I, I don't at all agree that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt uh, is that kind of threat. I actually think the Muslim Brotherhood should be, if anything, encouraged. I hope they win more political seats. Um, but it is profoundly in the interest of the United States to find whatever small ways it can to produce more political openness in these countries to make it possible for there to be some alternative between submission to an oppressive state and extremist activity. So it's, gonna, it's very difficult because these leaders recognize that if, you, if they open up that valve a little bit, it can blow off. And so they're incredibly careful about opening the valve a tiny bit and then screwing it back on tight when there's too much public 
uh, pressure, whether this is true in Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Jordan or Morocco, uh, we have to consistently use such pressure as we can. And it is limited in order to encourage these leaders to create more political space in their countries. I would just add a footnote to that. Uh, this refrain has come up again and again and again in U.S. policy. And we go through, through waves where we say, okay, we're going to push for democracy, openness, and human rights. We do it in one or two cases. And then there's pushback, and then we pull back. And then that inconsistency makes us sound very hollow. So we ought to look before we leap and make sure that if we say something like that, we actually say, in this country, we're going to take a stand and we're really going to push or this target, that we have the commitment to do so when there's pushback. And we take the consequences, and we try to anticipate the consequences. But the worst thing you can do is to say, OK, we're now going to push for more openness. We're going to push for democracy. And then we collapse. We, As we, we did don't in have Egypt. Stand. As we did in Egypt. Well, and in fact, that's the, the interesting backstory to that famous Bush line that you mentioned from his second inaugural, is that he came out with this stirring cry uh, you know, against tyrannies around the world and that they should uh, tremble. And that line was inserted in the speech uh, without any of the bureaucracy being aware that this was going to be the grand new organizing principle for the second term. So not only did they not look before they leaped, but even on their own team, they weren't prepared with any kind of a follow through to such a you know, really massive rhetorical um, rallying cry, which I think is an interesting example. I've promised this man in the hat that he could speak, so he may. Thank you very much. In the early 60s, we were saying in Africa, Yaya Fanusi, Yaya Fanusi with the US for US Africa Coalition. In the early 60s, we were saying most of the countries in Africa are not viable, and it cost us only $10, $10 to come to that conclusion. Now you're only taking millions to come to about failed state. The announcement we're <laughs> making because of our historical movement that imagine forces now in Africa is 2017, less than seven years from now. There's going to be a United State of Africa. It's a metaphor. So you know exactly what we're talking about. And 2015, five years from now, there'll be a referendum on the draft, the final version of the Constitution. And the countries which vote yes, they are the ones who will be in it. The relevance for you and your government is to make sure that the United States do not oppose the creation of the United States of Africa, whatever form it will take by the Constitution. Because we are going to make sure that all the oil producing countries in Africa are in that federation. Thank you. Okay. Not sure there was a question there, so we'll go right here to this lady in the front. Yeah, my name is Patricia. I'm originally from Botswana. Um, I'm actually confused as to who defines failure and in whose terms that failure is. Initially, when the discussion started, it was, I thought it was going to take uh, the usual trend of the security, uh, threatening American interests elsewhere in the world. I'm looking at all these countries. A lot of them, historically, had nothing to do with the United States. And there are countries that have Western countries that have been working with these countries. And I have been listening. There's no mention that America is partnering with other countries to try to formulate an international policy for these countries. So I'm now wondering why America wants to go it all alone excluding other structures that are in place. There are regional organizations. There is the UN. So why does America always want to go it alone? And in any case, the problems like Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is more of a political and economic problems. It has nothing to threaten it the security of the United States. So what is America's interest in Zimbabwe and other like countries? Thank you. I just want to address one little piece of that, uh, which is I think that um, 
that's, there is a genuine, uh, the, the, let me put it this way. When we hear that failed states are the biggest problem the United States faces, that is shorthand for failed states causes problems that in the end cause problems for the United States. That in turn tends to be shorthand for terrorism. And so it is a question that has not fully been faced. What is the motivation for the United States to act, and why should we feel the United States will act in the case of countries that do not pose a security threat to the United States? Obama says in general that these places will cause problems that, whether it's epidemics and, and things like that, uh, but it may be that in the end, American efforts and the efforts of the international community will focus overwhelmingly on states in the Islamic world that are seen as posing a terrorist threat and ignore countries like, let's say, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, whose problems are just as grave, but in fact, don't really threaten the United States. I think there's also a, um, an emerging understanding that failing states are threats not just because they directly threaten U.S. interests, but they are threats, first of all, to their own people. That's what failure is. They're failing their own people. Uh, but secondly, that where you have an epidemic of this or a cluster uh, or a chronic cycling of such failure, that you then have a large part of the world, at least a billion people or more, at least some 60 states, depending upon how you count, that really can't participate in solving the transnational problems that we face, not just terrorism, but pandemics, climate change, uh, nonproliferation, uh, energy independence. All of these larger issues require capable states. All policies are dealt with state by state, and you need a certain measure of state capacity to be able to fulfill your obligations as a sovereign country. Where those capabilities are weak, and you're always focusing on conflict. And some of these states become wards of the international community where there has to be peacekeeping troops sent in or foreign aid sent in. Well, then the international community has a right to say, we're paying for this. We're, we're, we're risking blood and treasure to, to shore up these weak states. And, and in return, we're getting more problems on our plate. So it's not just that these states are threats to U.S. interests and, and our seedbeds of terrorism, which is a very common uh, point of view. But in the larger sense, when you have a large part of the international community that cannot function in terms of resolving or addressing global problems, you've got a real problem on your plate. Listen, we have time for just one more question. I want to thank everybody in advance for uh, all your patience. In the very back there, or, no, I meant you. Uh, Saram Sefer, uh, Middle East Youth Initiative with the Brookings Institute. Um, my question is about Yemen um, versus Greece. Um, Yemen is a, is a country that is on the path of um, failure as well. Um, however, recently, um, President Obama has also, um, let's say, blessed the uh, last elections and, um, and congratulated um, um, the, the president of Yemen. However, like, how does that change? I mean, that that is a problem. But then, where in in Greece, um, where corruption is also a problem, but it doesn't. It's not. I don't see it as a as a growing problem in terms of uh, a failure state. So, what what is the difference between both states, in your opinion? Well, I don't know that we need to say much about Greece. I mean, Greece obviously has a big economic problem. It's not so terribly different from the economic problems that other European countries suffer from. Uh, Yemen could be the next Afghanistan. And so, you know, we haven't said anything about Yemen so far. Uh, it's not clear what kind of leverage the United States is going to have. It's not clear what level of control the current regime uh, has over large parts of the country. Uh, and as we look forward and think, okay, what's next? Uh, Yemen is somewhere on that vast spectrum between Haiti and Afghanistan. It is not wholly afflicted with conflict, but large parts of it are. 
It's mountainous like Afghanistan. It's desperately poor, though not as poor as Afghanistan. It's poorly governed, and it poses a potential threat to the United States in the sense that we've been talking about because these areas prove to be a fastness and a sanctuary for terrorists. So, so Yemen is, is coming to a movie theater near you. I would just add that uh, the problem of Greece is not a minor problem. Uh, it, uh, it is a case of a, of a substantial failure, but it's an economic failure, uh, not one in terms of, uh, I would say, threatening civil war uh, as, as Yemen has. So the security problems are much uh, less in Greece. Secondly, you've got a, a whole continental structure to deal with it, and you've got other economic institutions to deal with it because it's an economic problem with governance implications um, that, that requires uh, a kind of remedy that we tend to use uh, and we know how to use. It's just a matter of political will. Whereas in the case of Yemen, I think that's where you have the multifaceted kinds of failures in so many respects. And it's the kind of uh, failure that can create uh, ripple problems that spill over its borders and threaten the region, if not the world. Listen, I want to thank everyone here for coming today, uh, and especially Pauline and, and Jim for this good discussion. And please do uh, check out both uh, foreignpolicy.com uh, as well as the print magazine.